Hello, my name is Sirku Johola and I will be talking about air pollution prevention and policy. I will focus specifically on two topics, the history of air pollution prevention and air pollution prevention policies and how those can be used in the cities to improve their air quality. Problems with air pollution in urban areas have been known for a long time, but the attitude towards them was often ambiguous. To a certain extent, they were even considered a symbol of growth and prosperity, and the attempts to combat them were scattered and ineffective. However, this changed in December 1952, which is often considered an event that has led to the birth of modern air pollution legislation and abatement. The Great Smug of London lasted four days and was the result of an anticyclone, a cold weather spell, as well as the use of coal in heating. This episode is said to have led to the excess death of 4,000 Londoners. Until after the Second World War, the most important urban compound was sulfur dioxide, combined with soot from the use of fossil fuels in heat and power production. Over the last 40 years, European emissions of sulfur dioxide had continued to rise, as did urban concentrations in many cities until the 1970s. This was partly due to the fact of location of industries within city centers. These problems were partly solved by higher stacks, the use of cleaner fuels in industrial activities, as well as the cleaning of flue gas in urban areas. As industries relocated outside of the city centers, the increasing growing traffic has given rise to nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds that affect urban air quality. Here is a schematic presentation of a typical development of urban air pollution levels. In the beginning of industrial development processes, urban pollution concentrations rise. As a result, emission controls are is initiated that aim to curb uh, air pollution. This eventually leads to the stabilization of air quality and slowly to the improvement of air quality as also higher technology is applied. Most cities are considered to follow this type of development, which eventually leads to stabilization under the national standard or WHO guideline. The soundest way to combat air pollution is to limit emissions and identify the source and the, the resulting pollutants. This very pragmatic way aims to state how much pollution there may be in a particular ambient air and regulate dispersion accordingly. This requires measurements at the source, which can be time and cost intensive. There are also new methods that include modeling and simulations of particular emission sources and their locations within the urban environment. There are a number of policy frameworks that need to be in place in order to manage efficient policies and regulating air quality. Administrative and legislative frameworks are needed to ensure adherence to regulatory emissions controls. In addition, there needs to be monitoring, reporting and auditing programs for effective control of sources. This often requires considerable technical, human and financial resources in order to manage the system. Legislation enabling effective penalties to discourage violation of emission limits is also required. If a particular instance violates the emission limits, there has to be a way to ensure penalties are paid. To make sure that the system functions effectively, different types of cost analysis should ensure that appropriate measures are taken so that the cost of establishing, carrying out and enforcing the regulations are not disproportionate to their benefits. I highlight three air pollution abatement strategies in this lecture that can be used to curb air pollution in urban areas. First, there are technology-based advances that can be induced by different types of legislation. Secondly, there are economic instruments and emission taxes that can be used to steer behavior. And thirdly, urban land use policy can help to create urban environments that create opportunities for good air quality. Successful mix of these strategies and policies is always context dependent and these are often tied to the economic and social development of a city. 
Nevertheless, there are successful examples of air pollution prevention in several contexts where a combination of these three factors can be identified. New technologies have shown to be particularly effective in curbing urban air pollution from transportation. Over the last 30 years, there have been radical improvements to fuel and battery technologies, which have contributed to reduction in air pollution. Buses and taxis are the most widely used vehicles for urban public transportation in developing countries, and introducing technological improvements in these modes of transport can significantly reduce urban air pollution. However, there are significant constraints on what improvements to fuels and technologies alone can deliver, especially as the increase in transportation globally continues to rise. Market-based programs are an economic instrument that is an alternative to command and control regulations. This allows for a broad mix of emission reduction options that can be exercised among a group of emitters and steer their behavior through economic incentives. These types of instruments include emissions trading or congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is often linked to transport where a particular area of a city can result in an additional fine for a car owner to drive to that area. Taxes on pollution provide clear incentive to polluters to reduce emissions and seek out cleaner and sustainable alternatives. Finally, urban land use policy is a process that can be used to steer the development of the urban form towards an environment that creates conditions for better urban air quality. Urban planning itself is a technical and political process that's concerned with the use of land and design of the urban environment and form, which includes the use of air, water and other natural resources. When it comes to creating favorable conditions for urban air quality, planning needs to take into account infrastructure passing into and out of urban areas, such as transportation and distribution networks. Other incentives that can be created by planning include encouraging people to live closer to where they work, developing cost-effective and convenient mass transit networks, creating economic activities outside of megacities to reduce migration incentives, and strategically locating industries in order to improve air quality. However, there are challenges with existing structure of cities and how much of this can be changed 